Hello, and welcome to this year's 2021 Black History Month Civil Rights Concert, which we have entitled A Call for Anti-Racism and Social Justice. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, this concert took much longer to assemble and produce than the month of February, the National Black History Awareness Month, provided. Hence, we are presenting the concert this month in May. Fall 2020 saw the Faculty Senate discussing how we might impact our teaching with a view to the recent anti-racist rhetoric widely espoused over the summer and early fall. Indeed, the subject was so topical that our own music program held a number of faculty discussions about how an argument could be made that our study of Western music theory and practice could be viewed as racially biased, particularly as seen through the white framing and theoretical analysis of Albert Schenker. Such talk prompted me to look at how I was presenting issues of social justice in my own online classroom and how my students and I might respond. After myriad discussions in most of my classes, my focus began to shift as I assigned repertoire and recordings and reflected upon the opinions and views my students shared regarding this new, narrower narrative. For many years, a decade at least, my students and I have presented a concert in late February whose performances and presentations surrounded the subject of civil rights, human dignity, and the historical struggles for justice with underpinnings of calls for civility and unity. Each year we have worked diligently to speak with a compassionate voice, to play with great fervor and abandon, and to sing with an open throat. We regularly presented a narrative of ethnic, racial, and gender parity. We tried to encompass the concerns of our nation's poor, homeless, racial, and ethnic minorities, and all those among us living on the periphery of our great society, as LBJ once referred to it. We exhibited this broad scope with last year's presentation of We're All In This Together. The concert included presentations and performances on racism, bigotry, anti-Semitism, sexism, ageism, disabled, children with special needs, LGBT community, communities of color, immigration, dreamers, the wall, and the undocumented community. We even had room on that very long concert for an outstanding presentation on the Rwandan genocide. Because we survived a long year of historical pestilence and an even longer summer of racial infamy, we decided to narrow our focus with this year's concert, which we have entitled A Call for Anti-Racism and Social Justice. Before we begin our concert, I want to share with all of you some insights from our myriad discussions which preceded the formation of the presentations and performances that you will see this evening by our students and faculty. The community of students with which I interact each year is a marvelous mix of young and mature students. The real beauty of such a musical group is the various perspectives such a diverse congregate has on life, society, and of course, music. Additionally, SBVC has a preponderance of students from very different backgrounds, origins, ethnicities, languages, and cultures. Much of the material in the presentations and performances that you will hear this evening is drawn from the experiential and anecdotal evidence of our students. This, of course, informs the artistic expression with a sense of having lived it, a fundamental requisite in rendering any artistic performance. As the teaching of course, of performance is my field of experience, I spend an inordinate amount of time, as a matter of course, talking about what prompts us to play, sing, or speak. This year was no exception, and I think you will find the results uniquely interesting. We would like to begin our concert with a video performance of Lay Your Body Down by Stephen Stills. 
this performance by David Begnell. America was founded on the premise of equality and freedom, promised originally to all white men of certain class. When Thomas Jefferson penned the Declaration of Independence, the ink dried forming these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But what was meant by all men? At the time, it was a male who owned property, had some standing in society, or a worker who could afford a poll tax. The definition has evolved in the last 245 years to include women, black people, indigenous people, and legal immigrants, rich or poor. Aside from the American Indians, we are a nation of immigrants. America has been catching up to the idea of equality since its foundation in 1776. It has been a gargantuan struggle. America is not a place. It is an ideal we seek to attain, a collective goal. There are those who disagree on exactly what freedom is. It is a struggle. The struggle is sometimes tumultuous, violent, bloody, divisive. Yet we seek consensus. We desire union. We yearn for harmony. The path is arduously long and winding. It is a dangerous road fraught with peril. Yet we persevere. And what is the price of freedom? We stand on the bones of those who struggled and died, attempting to realize this uncommon ideal. Delivered in chains, used inhumanely, running from the yoke and the whip, chased by slave hunters, hindered by Jim Crow laws enacted to oppress shunned by white society, set apart from the commons while eating, drinking water, using the bathroom, riding a bus, entering through the front door. Beaten, lynched, incarcerated, sold as a labor commodity, imprisoned, segregated, gerrymandered, denied a voice, a vote, an opportunity, a breath. The black man, woman, and child tread forever onward. There stands in Montgomery, Alabama, a beautiful black granite memorial to those who have given their lives in pursuit of the civil rights struggle between 1954 when the Supreme Court outlawed segregation in schools and 1968 when Martin Luther King was assassinated by a white supremacist Engraved on the smooth stone are 41 names. Each name was a person with his own unique story of struggle that ended in a violent death. They are to be considered martyrs for the civil rights movement. Not included were the names of 74 people also killed in the struggle because not enough was known about their lives. They will be remembered as the forgotten Many are the forgotten in the timeless struggle for freedom and equality. Many have laid down their lives in pursuit of Thomas Jefferson's ideal, so elegantly stated in the Declaration of Independence. What is the cost of freedom? I have arranged a protest song, a lament really, written by Stephen Stills, written released by the band Crosby, Stills, Nash Young in 1970, after the Civil Rights Movement and near the end of the unpopular Vietnam War. The message is universal and as relevant today as it was in the 70s. Many have died so that we can be free. The words 
are simple and timeless. Find the cost of freedom buried in the ground. Mother Earth will swallow you. Lay your body down. we discussed in class included the fundamental inequities under which the poorer communities, immigrant communities, and communities of color suffer with housing shortages, rising rents, Section 8 housing, and resources for the disabled and indigent people. SBVC and a number of other surrounding community colleges have many programs for the hungry, homeless, and needy students. The criminal justice system, rife with substantial rates of disproportional incarceration and with which a great many of my students have become familiar, was another source of discussion. In part because black America is so poorly represented across corporate America, little of the $2 trillion economic relief package sent by last year's Congress was seen in communities of color across the country. Even the Tulsa massacre of 1921 was mentioned in the context of our discussions about the devastation of the black economic community. We have tried to include something of these discussions in this concert. Our next performance is by Carol Brandt and the song is the well-known spiritual, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. This is Carol Brandt, and I'll be singing Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. Oh, 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 oh. 
Clearly, a part of this summer's Black Lives Movement was a push to change the rhetoric. We quickly learned that it was no longer okay to hide behind the statements, well, I'm not a racist, I don't exhibit racist behavior. And if a racist thought flits through my head, well, thoughts are not actions, so I guess I'm okay. We talked about the adage, all that is necessary for evil to persist is for a good woman or man to do nothing. Many of us felt that this adage was appropriate in explaining the shift in rhetoric. We heard this summer's talk about systemic racism, so new that many dictionaries are hurrying to redefine racism to reflect this new awareness. Assuredly, while the term might have been new to many, the concept was not new in communities of color. This too we discussed. The next performance is by David Whitmore, and the song is entitled Black Day in July. My name is David Whitmore. I graduated from San Gregorio High School in 1973 in San Bernardino. From 1971 to 1973, we had race riots in each year that closed the school down. I was kind of oblivious to the reason why I was just put out that the school was closed down. It wasn't until 1975, while serving with the 82nd Airborne, getting ready to deploy into Boston for riot control during the Boston busing riots, that I got a clue what the riots were about. My good buddy, who I played folk music with, turned me on to the song by Gordon Lightfoot called Black Day in July. It's pretty self-explanatory. It was actually banned on the radio for being too controversial. Here's Black Day in July. Black Day in July Motor City madness has touched the countryside And through the smoke and cinders you can hear far and wide The doors quickly bolted, the children locked inside Black Day in July Black Day in July The soul of Motor City is buried across the land the book of law and order is taken in the hands of the sons of the fathers who died in this land. Black Day in July. 
Black danger thine In the streets of Motor City There's a deathly silent sound The body of a dead youth Lies stretched upon the ground Upon the filthy pavement No reason can be found Black danger thine Black danger thine Motor City madness Has touched the countryside The people rise in anger The streets begin to fill There's gunfire from the rooftops The blood begins to spill Black danger thine In the mansion of the governor, there's nothing that is known for sure. The telephone is ringing and the pendulum is swinging. You wonder how it happened when you really know the reason. It wasn't just the temperature, it wasn't just the season. Black day in July, black day in July. Motor City's burning and the flames are running wild. Reflect upon the waters, the river and the lake Everyone is listening and everyone's awake Black day in July, black day in July The printing press is turning and the news quickly flash You read your morning paper, you sip your cup of tea you wonder just in passing, is it him or is it me? Black day in July In the office of the president, the deed is done, the troops are sent Really not much choice, you see, it looks to us like anarchy Then the tanks go rolling in to patch things up as best they can Is no time to hesitate, the speech is made, the dues can wait Black day in July Black day in July In the streets of Motor City now are quiet and serene The shapes of gutted buildings strike terror in the heart You sounded it happen, you sounded it start Why can't we all be brothers, why can't we live in peace The hands of the have-nots keep falling out of reach Black day in July Black day in July The Motor City madness has touched the countryside And through the smoke and cinders you can hear it far and wide The doors are quickly bolted, the children locked inside Black day in July Black day in July Black day in July It was in this context of systemic racism that I recall discussing with my class a local hero of mine, Doc Rivers, former head coach of the LA Clippers. I shared with my students an interview this past summer given in the bubble by Doc Rivers, where I witnessed him saying with tears flooding his eyes, the problem is that many of us black people love this country, but this country doesn't love us back. That simple, clear, precise statement speaks to the nature of love and its attendant fellow reciprocity or lack thereof. For me, it was a clarion bell, a call to arms that flooded my tear ducts and broke my heart. After hearing of it, many of us decided in some of our discussions that institutionalized racism or systemic racism was the very concept that Doc Rivers was making that night. We talked about white privilege and that while many people never mentioned it, many of us have enjoyed the privilege throughout our lives. Some of us believe that the pillars holding aloft the pantheon of power in this country must come down. And the affirmation often heard this summer 
As we rebuild our country in light of the COVID-19 devastation, let's rebuild it better. But that is a very fitting and apt expression. This view was expressed in many of the demonstrations we saw around the country, as well as dramatically played out in Portland, Oregon this past summer. Our next performance is by Yasuna Morita, singing We Shall Overcome. Hello, I am Yasuna Morita. I am from Japan and have lived in America for a long time. I major in music. I started playing the piano when I was four years old. I studied U.S. history at Crafton Hills College, but I still think that some history has not changed much yet. In the United States, during World War II, 120,000 Japanese Americans were taken to internment camps. I went to visit Manzona Camp in California. I also watched the historical movie made by Japanese people about their experiences at Manzuna. Many Japanese committed suicide there. However, new Japanese American lives were born there. When I visited Manzuna, I saw a lot of sad pictures there. I started crying. It seems that the souls of the Japanese people who lived there had passed on to me. I could not explain it. Everyone, please visit and learn about it. Nelson Mandela said, Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. I think human life an issue for the 21st century everywhere. We have a right to live and be happy in this developed country of the United States. Confucius said, Education breeds confidence. Confidence breeds hope. Hope breeds peace. COVID-19 is spreading all over the world, and the year has passed and it has made society worse. Now, Asian Americans are being targeted for COVID-19. I am very sad to see film footage of this report. Asian American people have been attacked. We Asian Americans also have civil rights. Like African Americans had to overcome adversity, so we Asian Americans have to overcome adversity. Therefore, I choose to sing We Shall Overcome by John Bias. This song shows a strong will to achieve people's consciousness and social reform in the deeper sense that we shall overcome. We Shall Overcome, which I need in my life now, has much meaning. Thank you.
Wochenende. Voting, the registration of voters, and voter suppression are concerns that were included in our discussions this past semester. Former President Obama has said that following the election of our first black president, too many supporters of social justice rested on their laurels, while the people who were unsuccessful in making former President Obama a single-term president did succeed in blocking much of the necessary legislation during the eight years of his administration. This is legislation that might have brought about substantive change in the African-American community and other communities of color. We discussed how issues of police injustice and brutality and the need for new and improved police training were of concern to many following in the footsteps of social justice. We believed that voting by all the people was an absolute necessity. We were in concurrence that voting should be made easier, not harder. We talked about voting throughout the most recent election and its historic results. We thus discussed how faith in a democracy was intricately woven with our respect for the integrity of the vote and the diverse group of Republicans, Democrats, as well as independent and third party workers who were diligent in their efforts to get out the vote, who saw that it would be fairly cast, counted and certified, needed to be given due accord and respect for their efforts. Again, we were in concurrence that such accord paid deference to the very sanctity of our democratic ideals. Many too were proud that our court system stood up to the onslaught of charges, conspiracy theories and falsehood that followed the election results, affirming that our nation's democracy still stands for truth, transparency and the rule of law. And now singing Amazing Grace, here is Lucy McIntosh. My name is Lucy McIntosh. I'll be singing Amazing Grace. And in order to introduce this song, I'll start by reading Luke 6.31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. In talking about social justice, I consider it of great importance to remember that the practice of the golden rule would pave the way to move forward in forging peaceful interactions between the citizens of this wonderful country. As Christians, we are told to love our neighbor as ourselves. Moreover, we are directed to love our enemies. It is never late to learn and implement these wonderful principles. As a domestic violence and abuse survivor, I can testify that it is only by the grace of God, that amazing grace, that we can accomplish that feat. John Newton, who wrote the words for Amazing Grace, was a person who experienced that change of heart and he made it the purpose of his life to correct the practice of slave trading that he previously had been part of. He expressed that he was doing it by promoting the life of God in the soul, between quotation marks. 
he wrote the words for the hymn Amazing Grace in 1772 to express his gratefulness for God's truly amazing grace. Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It was great. One of the things I marveled at during the 60s was how the protesters were able to maintain their resolve in the face of adversity. The next performance is by Eric Bauer, and he'll be singing a song the Reverend Ralph Abernathy taught to the people with whom he marched to keep up their resolve. 
The song is entitled, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Round. Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around. This spiritual was first presented in Albany by Reverend Ralph Abernathy in 1962. At that time, there were mass arrests and demonstrations. The Reverend taught the song to the demonstrators present during a meeting at the Mount Zion Baptist Church. It became popular quickly. In fact, there's actually a CBS documentary showing students clapping and singing the words, ain't gonna let Chief Pritchett turn me around. This despite of the fact that the students were being arrested while singing the song. I would now like to perform the song while clapping. I can see the demonstrators walking to the clap. Ain't gonna let nobody, Lordy, turn me round. Turn me round. Turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody, Lordy, turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, Lord. Keep on a talking, Lord. Marching on to freedom land. Ain't gonna let nobody, Lordy, turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody, Lordy, turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, Lord, keep on a talking, Lord, marching on to freedom land. Ain't gonna let nobody, Lordy, turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody, Lordy, turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, Lord, keep on a talking, Lord, marching on to freedom land. Government or the governing bodies, listen. Communities of color for many years have felt enervated by a history of voter suppression, low voter enrollment, low census counts that led to low civic representation, poll taxes, and other corrupt voter registration laws. Many of us were stunned to see the NBA suspend play stand up and speak out for policies that circumvented many of these obstacles to free and valid voting. The repurposing of vacant arenas as voting venues and the constant messaging during games to get out the vote were very effective in raising the vote count to unprecedented levels, especially in urban areas and with communities of color. In recognizing from whence the vote came, we heard from an historically apathetic community whose vote was perhaps the most difficult of all to turn out. And that was the community of teens and young people just starting out with their lives. The very same young people that turned out to protest this summer turned out to vote this fall. Our next singer is a lovely young woman who may well be matriculating at one of our nation's historically black colleges, Howard University, in the fall. Her name is Jasmine Harrell, and she'll be singing A Change Gone Come. Long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die. Cause I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. I go to the movie and I go downtown. 
Somebody keep telling me Don't hang around It's been a long A long time coming But I know A change gonna come It's been a long A long time coming But I know change gonna come oh yes it will well change did come after the vote with an enormous turnout this past fall after many months the republican party and even the president eventually conceded the victory to the liberal and progressive wing of the democratic party but not until those people in the country had their say about their unwillingness to share power. On January 6th, the day when Congress traditionally casts the electoral ballots to certify the election, a rampaging mob of people stormed the United States Capitol building, killing and injuring Capitol Police and desecrating the very hallowed halls of government. This to me, and in the mind of many of my students, was a blatant example of systemic racism and the inequities in our executive and judicial branches of government. Singing a wonderful rendition of We Shall Overcome. Here is Jan Hankin. We Shall Overcome, Music and Lyrical Adaptation by Sylvia Horton, Frank Hamilton, Guy Carawan, and Pete Seeger. On September 2, 1957, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. visited Highlander Folk School in Tennessee. Part of the school's mission was to help prepare for civil rights workers to challenge unjust laws and racist policies that discriminated against African Americans. The school also made a point of bringing blacks and whites together to share experiences and to learn from each other. It was a dangerous idea. At a time when Southern laws kept blacks and whites segregated or separate, some white racists terrorized African Americans with deadly violence. Dr. King delivered the main speech that day, honoring the school's 25th anniversary. As part of the meeting, folk singer Pete Seeger got up with his banjo. He plucked out a song he had learned at Highlander and led the audience in singing it. Later that day, Dr. King found himself humming the tune in the car. There's just something about that song that haunts you, he said to his companions. We Shall Overcome soon became the anthem of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. It offered courage, comfort, and hope as protesters confronted prejudice and hate in the battle for equal rights for African Americans. This song has a long history. Will Overcome first appeared as a protest song during the 1945-1946 labor strike against American tobacco in Charleston, South Carolina. African American women strikers, seeking a pay raise to 30 cents an hour, sang as they picketed. I Will Overcome was a favorite song of Lucille Simmons, one of the strikers but she gave the song a powerful sense of solidarity by changing the I into we, and they sang together. Other lyrics were improvised for pro-union purposes, including we will organize, we will win our rights, and we will win this fight. It is very important to recognize, especially with the Black Lives Movement this past summer, that minorities, and in this case, the African American people, are still fighting for their rights hundreds of years later. This song speaks deep to my soul. Please ask yourself this question. If not now, then when?
Sports organizations around the country have made concerted efforts toward taking an anti-racist stance. One of the more outspoken leaders from that group was LeBron James of the Lakers. Following the widespread demonstrations for social justice around the country, he was asked about what progress would look like, and he responded, we want to see more love than hate. This simple statement, so profound in its simplicity, has long resonated in artistic performances around the country. For many years, the arts have tried to express this same sentiment with performances that revealed and celebrated life in the black community. Here is a slice of life from the greatest ragtime composer of all time, Scott Joplin, with Carol Brandt singing Trimonisha from the opera Trimonisha by Scott Joplin. And dances, including a kind of pre-blues music and a call and response style scene featuring a preacher and congregation. The opera celebrates African-American music and culture while stressing that education is the salvation of African-Americans. The heroine and symbolic educator is Tremanisha herself. It takes place on a former slave plantation. After Tremanisha has been taught to read, she leads her community against the influence of conjurers who are shown as preying on ignorance and superstition. The community ultimately realize the value of education and the liability of ignorance, 
also learning hard work and community solidarity as the best formula for advancing the race. The community then choosing Trimanisha as their leader. And now the song, The Sacred Tree from Trimanisha by Scott Joplin. Carol Brandt singing The Sacred Tree from Trimanisha.
Equal justice, equal respect, equal opportunity, and equal pay. These are the cries that came from many black musicians over the years in this country. Here to discuss the great injustices done to some of our most treasured black musicians is Ethan Brake, a fine young tenor from our group who will be transferring this summer to Cal State University, Sacramento as a jazz major. He will now play a piece entitled Round Midnight by the genius of jazz, Thelonious Monk. My name's Ethan. I'm a trumpet player. I have always loved playing trumpet. I've been playing trumpet since I was about, probably about 11. I was in the fifth grade when I first started playing. Uh, the entire reason I wanted to play was because I love jazz music. I was intru introduced to jazz with uh, the trumpet player Louis Armstrong as early as third grade, and that really inspired uh, a love of trumpet playing in me. And I think that that inspiration took hold in an entirely different way the first time I heard Miles Davis. And whether I realize it or not, I, when I play jazz, I am trying to sound like Miles because I have loved Miles so much for so long. The first album of his that I had heard was The Birth of the Cool. And I played that CD out uh, so much. But the album of his that has meant the most to me, the album of his that I spent the most time grinding through and trying to play along to has been Roundabout Midnight. 
and particularly the opening song, Round Midnight. It's been one of my all-time favorite jazz songs f forever. I love Thelonious Monk, but Miles Davis's interpretation of it is just amazing. I've heard it so many times. I've heard him play it so many different ways. But the one that I come back to, the one that I love the most, is the one off of his album, Round Midnight. Now, it wouldn't be until much later that I would see the interview and hear the story of Miles Davis and being beaten by police on the street outside of his rehearsal hall where he had his own name on the marquee. Uh, the the officer basically just didn't like the fact that Miles Davis, a black man, was standing on the street smoking a cigarette just in a way that he didn't like. The officer was drunk. You know, the other musicians who came up to help Miles in, in this situation, like, they could smell the alcohol on this cop's breath. And... He had just, you know, not even a week ago, had released one of the best-selling jazz albums of all time, Kind of Blue. And, you know, this is a story that happens to black musicians, uh, to an extension black people, all over the country for the entire time that we've been a country. The story of Miles Davis having his altercation with police on the street is no different from... NWA having their own this essentially the same situation which led them to write the song fuck the police there's probably about 40 or so years removed from those two incidents and it's never stops no it's something that has been ongoing and we've seen it come to ahead again within the last year 2020 with the amount of state-sanctioned police violence and police murder that we saw throughout the course of last year. I feel incredibly privileged to play within this medium, to play within this style that has been created and pioneered by black musicians. Musicians that in the height of this style, the golden age of jazz, they weren't held to the esteem that they were touted as. They were made to go through back doors to get into the, their performance. They weren't allowed to sit with everyone else. They weren't treated like humans. They weren't treated like the amazing musicians that they had hired them as. And a lot of these musicians had the rights to their music taken from them. They were never fully paid. There are many stories of musicians coming out empty-handed. There are musicians like Nina Simone and Miles Davis who've had to go great lengths to make sure that they were paid for their work. I feel incredibly privileged to exist within this art form, especially because people who look like me were tormenting black musicians for playing the style that was a symbol of their culture. And I feel incredibly privileged to be able to exist with, within this medium despite that fact. With the hope that I can do this music justice, that I can do this music without pantomime, that I can do this music in a way that truly honors Miles Davis, that truly honors the context of the music, and I hope you enjoy it.
Other leaders who are hopeful about the fight against systemic racism believe that while a majority of people will, as Spike Lee said, do the right thing, a majority of those people do not always get out and vote. History was made this last November because they did. Older students in my classes, just as in our society at large, those that are the patient yet persistent among us, realize that change won't happen this year, or quite probably not even with this new administration. Sadly, we realize that it may not be for our eyes to see, but it is rather within the lives of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren that they may see the result of our anti-racist stance taken this day, and as with great solemnity, sip from that chalice emblazoned with the proud proclamation with liberty and justice for all. How sweet will be the taste of that elixir. Here to conclude our program is the spiritual Ride on King Jesus, a choral arrangement by Alice Parker, sung by our premier choral group on campus, Voci Soli. Thank you very much for being with us and listening to us today as we shared our Civil Rights 2021 concert with you. It is our fervent hope that you will allow the lyrics and the music that you heard today to linger within you for a while and perhaps resonate in your heart. And maybe this year, finally, we can say aloud a change Guan come.